Thank you, Russ, for having me on the National Lunch and Learn for Annie Mac Mortgage. And I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules for this opportunity to learn. Um, I believe learning is the greatest thing that we can do in life. And to take the time out of your business to focus on how can you learn something new to perform at a higher level and to achieve your goals is just outstanding. And I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming today. So I'm going to go quickly today. I don't have a lot of time. And I want to make sure that I'm serving your time well. Um, so what I want to start off with is explain to you quickly who I am and to give you a little bit of background. The reason I share this is because oftentimes when I'm watching a presentation, I'm often thinking to myself, who is this person and are they speaking from a place of knowledge from experience or did they just read this in a few books? Not that people that read things in books and regurgitate can't be great teachers and coaches. Just someone who has been there and done that, in my mind, has a little more weight and a little more validity. I sold homes for over 15 years in Denver, Colorado. I started at the age of 21, and in my first year, I sold 72 homes. I was featured in Remax Hall of Fame at the age of 24. At the time, they had told me I was the youngest person to ever have achieved the Hall of Fame of a million dollars in gross commission income. By that age. Yet since then I have met many people who have beaten that time um, themselves. I was featured in Real Realtor Magazine 30 Under 30 in 2002. I had sold over 3,000 homes in my career. In 2011 I was featured as the fastest growing real estate office in the nation. I was running that company and it was then also the number one commercial real estate office for the franchise I was working at at the time. Today, I have co-founded a company in Boulder, Colorado called Steps Real Estate. And we felt that there's a missing element in the real estate brokerage model today. And we felt through Steps Real Estate, we would have the ability to kind of create a company and a brand around the way we see real estate being managed. We were recently filmed on a reality TV show called Buying Boulder. And if you want to check it out, it's buyingboldertv.com, where it shows my partner, Kevin, and I and the challenges of selling real estate in one of the most competitive real estate markets in the country, Boulder, Colorado. It's truly entertaining, and I hope you take the time to look at it. My goal for you is that you have a happy, productive, fulfilling life and business, and really a business that you can be proud of, something that you could look back and say, hey, I invested five years, 10 years, 15 years of my life into this, and all of it was completely worth it. And by being here today, I hope to expose you to a different way of thinking about your practice and your business to help you achieve a higher level of success than you ever thought was possible. Now, when I start talking to people, here's the objections I get. These are the biggest obstacles. Now, some people might call these beliefs. Some people might call them limiting beliefs. Some people might call them limiting business beliefs. What I'd like you to do today is keep an ear out for these beliefs as you're listening to the presentation. Write these down. Number one belief is, I don't want to manage people. In business, we have to leverage ourselves. We have to create duplication of ourselves. That is the most challenging thing. The only way to do that is through three things. One is technology. Two is outsourcing, using somebody else that is not an employee. Number three is hiring an employee. And those are the three ways that we create leverage. Managing people is one of those ways. Number two is I don't need or want a big business. I'm not going to show you how to build a big business of a, a, a real estate team that has 15 members on it in order for you to sell 100 homes a year. Now, I'm not going to share with you that technique today. What I'm going to share with you is how to build a profitable business, not a big business. Yet, big isn't bad, and big isn't something you should be afraid of or ashamed of. I also hear the belief of, I don't need or I don't want money. 
or I'm not in this for the money. You know, I personally can appreciate that because I'm not in it for the money either. I never have been. Well, in my 20s, I was in it for the money. Today, I'm not. Today, I'm in business to challenge myself and to create opportunity for other people. And I hope that you think of ways for you to grow your business and challenge yourself because money isn't evil. The love of money may be evil, but what I believe is that money follows intention. Money is a byproduct of business. And what does money do is money creates opportunity. Write that down. Money creates opportunity. And opportunities is what creates happiness. And we all want opportunities. We want opportunities for our friends and our family. And we want opportunities for the, the people in our community and the people around us. And that's what you can do with money. The biggest objection I hear is, I don't have the time. And frankly, that's exactly the reason that we need to do this. That's exactly the reason you need to follow the techniques I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to show you how to get your time back. And the last one is, I don't have the money. Because people believe that in order to make money, you have to have money. And that's just simply not true. I've opened several businesses in my life and many, many investment properties I've bought over the years. And oftentimes, I don't use any of my own money. In fact, teaching you how to build a business slowly and logically and thoughtfully, you will have the money to invest in your business. You will have the money to achieve the things that you need to achieve because money follows intention. Next, I'd like to share with you what I call the success trap. And anyone who has achieved success has run into the trap. The way I see business is there's basically three departments. You have promotions, who drives, leads, and interest to the business. You have sales and service, which is the part of the business that follows up on the leads. They do some lead generation themselves. They give presentations, present contracts, set expectations, and manage the expectations that were set. And then you have delivery and management, which is what did you sell? So when you sell something in real estate, you're selling a listing contract, which is a contract that says that you're going to deliver upon a marketing schedule or a marketing plan. You sign a contract, an agency agreement, which says that you're going to provide a level of expertise to them and negotiations to them to allow them to achieve their goals and their dreams. So in real estate, it looks like this. We get out and we begin promoting ourselves. We start talking to our friends and families and marketing our business. We have follow-up relationships with our, our past customers that have bought and sold with us in the past. And then we provide events in order to give them an opportunity to come visit us, right, and see us face-to-face. -face. And this is our promotions department. And then sales and service is us doing appointments, meeting with them, giving presentations, either listing presentations or agency presentations. And we're presenting contracts, but not purchase to buy and sell contracts, but agency contracts to get them to commit to working with us. The actual contract of buying a home or selling a home is part of our delivery and our management. It's what we're selling them is our ability to write a contract for them and to service and negotiate that contract to get them to a successful sale at the end. That's part of our third division, which is delivery and management. So this is the process that every real estate agent follows. In fact, this is the market sales cycle of a real estate agent. The challenge is with real estate is our sales cycle is so long. In real estate, our sales cycle is 30 or 45 days or sometimes as long as 120 days. So what we end up having to do is in the middle of a sales cycle, we have to begin to promote ourselves again in order to obtain another client. And then in the middle of helping that client, we have to jump back to delivery and management. And we're literally task shifting sometimes throughout the day or sometimes even within the same hour of the day. And then we have to jump back in order to go do a presentation and we begin to get worn out because then we know if we don't get back to generating business and that we're, our business is going to suffer and ultimately fail.
So when you talk to top producers and you say, why did you build a business instead of operating as an independent agent? They often say, I had no choice. In order for me to achieve my goals, I had to do things differently. And that's what I'm going to share with you today is that understanding and the way that that person makes decisions in order to achieve success over and over and over again. And in fact, what I'm going to share with you today doesn't only work in real estate. This will work in any business that you own or manage. Let's get started. So today, we're going to understand the true issues that face a real estate agent. We're going to go over the organizational model of what it would look like to run a business that produces 100 transactions a year consistently, year over year over year over year. We're going to also talk about the way to set up your lead generation models and the decisions that are made around those. Let's get started. So first is understanding the true issues of a real estate business. Now, in order for you to understand these, first, I need you to understand how I define the business. Because if you can understand the way that I look at the business, I think it will help you understand the errors in some of the decisions that many agents make that are holding them back from achieving a higher level of success. Number one, the way I define an agent is somebody who's solely responsible for completing all the tasks to run the business. In fact, I've identified over 27 different tasks that have to incur in order to run the business. Two is practice. This is someone who has more, one or more people to help them or assist them with the task to run the business. So this could be somebody who's outsourced, somebody who might have a buyer's agent who is going to go show homes. That's outsourcing your showings. You might have a transaction coordinator, and that's somebody who's outsourced to help you with your paperwork. Now, this is a practice no different than a law firm or a chiropractor. I want you to think about a practice as any time that the lead person, the agent, the doctor, the chiropractor, the attorney, doesn't show up to work, their income stops. Their income literally stops coming in because the income of the business is solely dependent on them running and generating business. Now, we see this all the time when people say that they own a real estate brokerage, and yet if you remove their income from the brokerage, the brokerage does not have enough money to stay profitable. They are not running a brokerage. They are running a practice. So the third piece that I'd like to share with you is a business. In a business, roles and responsibilities are the business. It's the processes that are the business. So roles and responsibilities are clear and defined. No one or unique person is required to operate the business, including you. See, most of the time as an agent in a practice, it's built around the agent's ego and the agent's need and desire to feel worthy. The agent's need and desire to feel like they're part of it or in control of it. And in fact, the way to get free your time is to remove yourself from the business. It doesn't mean that you're not part of the business. It doesn't mean that you don't have a role within the business. What it means is that the business can operate with or without you there. You don't need to be present anymore for the business to achieve income. And this allows you growth. This allows you time. This allows you the opportunity to think about where your business is going and how to grow your business in the most efficient and effective way possible. Now, real estate roles and responsibilities are as follows. Sales, lead management, okay? So this is managing the leads we have, following up on those leads. Business marketing and managing the process of marketing the business. 
business management, which is your P&Ls, your profit and loss statements, your balance sheets, and what I call your KPIs. Your KPIs are your key performance indicators. Now we have lag KPIs and lead KPIs. A lag KPI is how many closings did you have this month. Closings are the result of other actions. They are not an action within themselves. So a lead KPI would be the physical action taken to achieve the next result. So I'll give you an example. A KPI can be number of, of dials made. Your second KPI could be number of people answered. Your third key KPI could be a number of appointments set, number of appointments gone on, number of presentations set, number of presentations given, number of contracts signed, number of contracts that went under contract, number of closings, each of which is a KPI, each of which should be measured within your business on a consistent basis. Listing marketing is a process that is done as part of our service or our delivery of our business. It is not by itself marketing the business. We are delivering the marketing of the listing that we agreed to in our listing contract. Transaction management is simply that, managing the process for transactions. And then file management and post-closing systems, which is once the file has been done and closed, where does that lead go to to ensure we do not lose touch and we remain top of mind? This is how I see the real estate roles and responsibilities. Because in order to achieve 100 transactions a year, I don't know anyone who can do this consistently by themselves. In fact, I have known and I've even coached agents that have achieved 100 transactions a year independently, okay, with some outsourcing, yet they don't do it consistently and to the level of the service that I require in my business, meaning service to the client that is consistent and effective over and over again. Because I want you to think about this. Referrals, referrals come from consistency. Because would you ever refer a company or another business that is inconsistent in what it delivers? In fact, the only reason you would ever refer somebody is because you believe that the product or the service that they're delivering is going to be consistent with the product and the service that you received the last time you were with them. So therefore, consistency drives referrals. Customer service comes from consistency. You cannot perform on 110% all the time and agents that do will burn out and become inconsistent and thus driving down the referrals. Now let's get into this. So here's your typical agent models or what I call team models. So we have agent with assistant and or outsourced help. So this is typically an agent gets busy they're doing 30, 35 transactions a year. They decide that they're going to hire somebody, but they don't really have a defined role for this person. They call them an assistant. It's kind of a catch-all. I need you to show a home. I need you to put a sign up. I need you to do my transaction management and get this contract sent over here. Everybody is responsible for everything all the time. Every single day is a panic. Every single day is like Groundhog Day where you relive everything over again in this sense of unreliability and responsiveness. The second is partners. Partners is typically two dependent agents who are leaning on each other. Both might be top producing agents. I'm not saying that they're not successful. They might be two great agents. One is really good at marketing and the other one might be great at handling the deals. One might be great at lead generation the other might be great at customer service, but both of them are dependent on the other to provide what they don't have. The challenge with partners is decisions are made by who enjoys what 
versus what is needed to drive the business. And therefore, when one person fails, like two trees leaning on each other in the woods, when the wind blows or the market sh shift in change, because both are dependent on each other, any shift will make them lean and fall. And typically when this happens, people are hurt, people are let down, and people are disappointed. The third is what I call a group. A group is multiple licenses or people who are working together to share costs, resources, and expenses. Each person within the group is working towards an individual goal. There's typically not a strong leader or a defined leader. The challenge with a group is in a group with individual goals, each isn't willing to share a percentage of their income into a pool to grow the business as a whole. Meaning they may share to limit expenses, but they're not going to share to invest into the business to make the business big enough to support one or all of them. This is a group. The fourth is what I call the mini brokerage. The mini brokerage has a defined leader and multiple real estate licenses. This is typically what I call a dependent business model, where the defined leader's job is to help drive leads into the business. The other licenses then feed off of those leads in order to provide some basic income for them. Then their intention is that they are supposed to go out and generate more business that is then shared within the group. Their goal is typically a high unit number or a high volume calculation in order to achieve some type of reward or accolades for their business with little or no care given back to the profitability of the business or the service level that they're providing. This is simply a brokerage inside of another brokerage. I define the business model as a business that exists to provide product or service to the customers. See, I believe that a business is here to serve the customer. The business is not here to serve me. If the business was just here to serve me, then I would sleep in every day. I would take off early every day. But when the business is here to serve a customer and the customer's needs, then it's very easy to answer the question. Are we supposed to be open today? Does the customer's expectations have us open? If the answer is yes, then the business is open that day. If the business is here to serve me, it's, am I going to work today? Do I feel like it? If I feel like no is the answer, then the business is closed and the customers are not served. Can you imagine going to any business that's successful and walking in and grabbing the door and the door being locked, and the note on the door that says, we're closed today, the owner didn't feel like coming to work. Yet how many real estate agents do we know that operate their business this way? Their business that's generating $100,000 and $200,000 a year, and yet they treat their customers with disrespect. A business has defined goals around profit and growth. Each individual has defined roles, and each role has measurable accountability. Now, profit ensures that the business will continue to be here to support the customers and the individuals within the organization for a longer period of time. Growth ensures that there's opportunities within the organization. One of the biggest challenges in leading people is to create opportunities. Because when you're leading people and you have a talented person from within your organization that you have spent time, money, and energy developing this person, if you do not create opportunity for them, they will leave. Roles give individuals focus and the ability to excel for you. When these people have defined roles, they know how to win for you. Accountability allows the owner to measure the progress of the business. The owner is responsible for ensuring that the accountability and the business 
is achieving the goals that it set out to, to do. So let's talk about mindset for a minute. Understanding that the mindset that got you to where you are right now, from 10 units to 30 units, it's about your individual skill level. Do you know what you need to do? Do you know how to list and sell properties? Do you know how to negotiate for a client? Do you have the discipline to follow through every time? Do you have the discipline to get out of, out of bed every day and get your butt to work? And do you have the mindset? Do you believe in your heart that you can truly achieve this goal? From 30 units to 75 units, you run out of time. At 30 units a year, the individual agent just simply cannot continue to perform and provide consistent customer service, consistent customer service for a long period of time. They have to learn to leverage. And you see at 30 units, we take a step back. That's because when we hire somebody and we train somebody, it takes our time and our energy to help them grow and to adapt to our business. At 75 units, we are now hiring and leading managers, not employees. I no longer hire employees. I only hire managers. Managers are independently responsible for their own portion of the business. They are responsible. I'm not. Because if I hire employees, I'm only giving myself another job, a job of ensuring everything is done. With managers, we hold them to the results and the accountability of what is needed for the business to achieve its goals. At 100 units, you become the brand. You are no longer required to operate inside the business. The business is generating now enough revenue for you to provide yourself a good salary and to think about the direction that you want to go from here. You become the brand, not the deliverable. When you make a call to a client, it may or may not be you, but it's your vision, your standards, and your accountability that everybody within your organization is practicing at. The rules of an agent, individual agent, are mindset, skills, and discipline. This is the rules of success for this agent. If you focus on your mindset, can I do this? I know I can do this. I believe in myself. If you develop the skills to sell real estate and you have the discipline to do it, you're going to be successful as an individual agent. But if you follow those same rules as a business owner, you will fail. As a business owner, the rules are people. Who else can do this for me? If I am the answer, it's the wrong answer. What process do I choose to follow? A process is a system of doing things, a way of doing something. So when you're doing your listing presentation and you're talking to a customer and you're telling them how you're going to market your home, that's your process. That's your unique deliverable. A system is a use of technology and or machinery that makes your process easier. The multiple listing service is a system. Send out cards is a system. These are ways to make your job more efficient and faster. So the rules of a business owner are what people, what processes, and what systems for me to deliver the expectations that my salespeople set on a more efficient path while maintaining my standards. On the side of the agent, time equals money. On the side of the business owner, leverage equals money. This is the freedom. This is what will allow you to own a business that's going to generate income for you even when you're not there. Now, what is the organizational model that I speak of? Well, let's first talk about the organizational models that we typically see over and over in the real estate industry. These models that fail us over and over. Number one is the single agent model, where the agent is the center of everything. This is an egocentric model where 
where they say to the client, I will do everything to help you. They say, if I had more time, I could do more. I could help more people. See, time is their biggest limitation. And as the single agent model, sure, they'll get up to 30 transactions a year, maybe even 40 transactions a year. But above that, because they're a human and not a machine, they will begin to tire and wear out and miss out on details. They're managing all the parts of the transaction. You notice that mortgage, title, other agents and clients have a feedback loop, a communication going back and forth. Lead generation, follow-up, and marketing is a single path. There's no feedback loop with lead generation, follow-up, and marketing. So when the agent gets busy, what ends up getting dropped is lead generation, follow-up, and marketing. And their business begins to fluctuate because when they have multiple transactions going on, they don't have time to lead generate, lead follow-up, and do their marketing. And because those three things don't complain when they're not being communicated to, they're easily forgotten about, and the business will ultimately fail. The team group model looks like this, where it's the same thing, where the agent, again, their ego, they are the center of everything. And what do they do? They add a buyer's agent. They add an assistant into their model. They might even add a transaction coordinator, which requires more feedback loops. And they say to themselves, we will do more. We will do everything. More is better. They often say, I need more leads. I need more leads. More leads will solve everything. They say, if I had more money, I'd get more leads. Yet this isn't the path. This isn't true. This just leads to more chaos, more people, more stress, and madness. We all see agents that do this. Their lives are crazy. They're panicked. They're running all over time. They're scattered. They're letting people down. They're letting their business down. They're letting their loved ones down. Oftentimes in this model, you'll see agents that are generating massive amount of units, but there's so many people on their team that many of them are starving. And I personally believe it's irresponsible of us as business owners to allow people within our organization to suffer. Now, a business model separates these two. The business model is, my business is here to help you. Not me. I'm not here to do everything for you. I'm here to ensure that my business, my processes, my systems, and my people are here to serve you and help you. And the number one question that a business owner asks themselves is, how am I getting in the way? See, I look at business very differently. I look at business like business is this child. And this child I want to grow up, no different than my children. And I want this child to have all the opportunities afforded to it. And oftentimes, I get in the way of this child because the child is growing up too fast and it scares me. Or I don't want to invest money into the child because I want to invest money into you know, things I enjoy, like a vacation or a new car. But yet the child is demanding it's time to grow. I need to get bigger. I need to learn more. I need to challenge myself. So I, as a business owner, I have to ask myself, am I supporting my business as I would my child? Or am I getting in its way and holding it down? We wouldn't do that to our children. Why would we do that to our business? Now I'm going to review next is the organizational model for a business. Now, to help you with this, I created this graph to help kind of describe the way I see it in my mind. See, in my mind, I see sales and operations as two separate divisions. And the dark line in the middle is to represent that these two things cannot cross over. We're not going to ask our sales to do operations, and we're not going to ask our operations to do sales. At the top is the owner. The owner is the only person who can see over what I call the wall. The dark line in the middle divides sales and operations. I think of this like a football game. See, in football, you have the owner who's up in the skybox. 
They don't go down on the field during the game. During the game is during the week when sales and operations are occurring and beginning to direct offense and defense. See, the owner stays in the skybox. And at the end of the game, they bring together offense and defense, review the play for the previous week, and then make changes from a thoughtful position and with a place of understanding instead of during panic and chaos during the week. Only the owner can go over the lines and make changes and decisions. Sales cannot direct operations, and operations cannot direct sales. Now, like I said earlier, I see sales and operations like two divisions on the same team, like an offense and defense. And at times, it's almost like two pistons in the engine of a car. If sales rises up and gets too strong and operations fails, then customer service falls short. Consistency begins to wane. And we start to fail our customers, and then we don't get referrals. If operations gets too big, and revenue doesn't keep up from sales, then we begin to lose money, and over time, the business fails due to bankruptcy. So as sales rises, operations has to rise too. And as operations rise, sales has to keep up. And so there are two pistons in the engine who are struggling to keep ahead of the other. This is why oftentimes sales and operations are at odds with each other. The sales people are frustrated with operations. The operations people are oftentimes frustrated with the sales people. And in fact, that's often just how a successful organization feels. You as the leader need to keep the focus on the end goal in mind and to remind them all that this struggle is all part of the process of achieving the goal of the business and serving customers at the highest level. And when you can keep people focused on that vision and passionate and excited, they'll be happy and the business will be successful. Here's the organizational chart as I see it. We have the owner. Write this down. The owner is responsible for the vision. What direction is this organization going? The standards. At what level of service are we not going to go below? And the accountability to the standards and to the vision. That's your job as the owner. That's your number one focus as the owner is to pay attention to the standards and the vision through accountability, okay? Sales is your sales manager, your lead listing agent, your lead buyer's agents, and your telemarketing division all fall on sales. Operations is in charge of business management, business marketing, listing marketing, and file management. The owner also has the opportunity in this model to act as either the sales manager or the operations manager. There are different divisions, yet there are specific roles. Each role is a sales manager role, a lead listing agent role, a buyer's agent role, and a telemarketing role. On the operations side, there's a business manager role, a business marketing role, a listing marketing role, and a file management role. Each individual person can have, have multiple roles and the owner can act as either a sales manager role or an operations manager role. But we cannot have the same person operate on both sides of the wall because it requires a different set of disciplines. See, oftentimes the owner will act as the sales manager and then also want to act as the operations manager. But then they'll ask their operations manager to, or their operations person who's doing their business marketing to also go show a buyer and then them as listing as the lead listing agent will also want to go run the business and do the rec recordings and accountability and then also do the listing marketing themselves. The challenge is with this is if the sales manager and lead listing agent have an appointment that is required for them to go on and they're limited on time, they're gonna make the choice of preparing and going on the appointment as opposed to getting their business marketing and listing marketing done in an efficient manner. And this is appropriate choice in that situation, although they never should 
have been in that role in the first place. So we must prevent them from dividing the line, from crossing the wall. Owners work as the sales manager and the listing agent. Now they can also show buyers or they can find somebody else to be the buyer's agent. And then somebody working in the operations manager is in charge of business marketing, business management. Because everything on the operations side is predictable. Everything on the operations side is something that costs money and doesn't generate revenue. Now I understand many of you believe that marketing generates revenue. Marketing has, doesn't generate revenue. Marketing generates leads. Okay, Sales generates revenue from the leads that marketing creates. Without consistency in marketing, we don't have consistency in our business and our leads will fluctuate and our business will also fluctuate. Next is understanding the lead generation model. Now, I believe that a balanced real estate business generates a percentage of the business off of referrals. About 20 to 30% is a good number. 30% off of past clients, 30% off of new business coming in, and 20% off of your professional referral networks. Now, if your business is new and you've been in business less than two years, new business might be 60% of your business. If you've been in business for 15, 20 years, then past clients are probably 50 or 60% of your business. But a business that is consistently growing over time, that's been in business between five and 10 years, you'll typically see a pattern arrive something similar to a 30-30-30 or a 30-30-20-20 ratio. Now, let's talk about and understand the difference between goals, strategy, and tactics. People often get this confused, and if you can understand this, then lead generation will become very simple for you in leading your people to find creative ways to generate business consistently with things that they're willing to do. So we want to start, number one, with a goal in mind. What is it that you're focused on? So goal is the vision. What are we going on? A singular focus within the standards of service that we spelled out that we're not willing to fall below. Because the reason I keep pushing on this is to do a lot of business, you have to be efficient. But efficiency and effectiveness work against each other. Oftentimes, when we're highly efficient, we're very ineffective. And we're, when we're very effective, we're oftentimes very inefficient. We want to balance the efficiency with the effectiveness. We do not want to give up standards to get efficiency, okay? We do not want to lower our standards to achieve that. Strategies are the ideas or plans to achieve our goal. It's the overall way of doing something. Multiple strategies are required to achieve your goal. It might take three or four or five different strategies to achieve a singular goal. Yet the goal is singular, the strategies are multiple. The tactic is the action and or process you use to achieve your strategy. It will take multiple tactics to achieve each strategy. This is a way to problem solve. If you learn this, you will never struggle with lead generation again. KPIs are key performance indicator. It's the measurables that we talked about earlier. These are all key performance indicators to ensure that we're on track to achieve our goal. Every tactic has a KPI. Every tactic has a measurable to ensure it's getting done. Here's an example. Our goal to sell 100 units in 2017. One of the strategies might be to begin a business to business marketing campaign. Number two strategy is to increase your referrals from your sphere of influence. Your number three strategy is to increase your telemarketing in order to increase more leads, in order to 
have more appointments to get more closings to achieve your units in 2017. Now we're going to take one of those strategies, just one strategy, begin a B2B marketing campaign as your strategy, a business to business marketing campaign. And you're going to choose three measurable actions that you can take consistently to achieve this goal. Action tactic number one, contact local businesses. That's a measurable. You can measure how many times you called, you can measure how many people answered, and how many appointments that you set from calling your businesses. Two, create a promotional newsletter. You can three, begin an exclusive networking group. Each of these are tactics to achieve the strategy of begin a B2B marketing campaign. Now KPIs, section begin a B2B marketing campaign, Tactic, contact local businesses, KPIs. Meet two new business owners each week is our minimum standard requirement to achieve our strategy. Number two, add two new business owners to your database each week. Measurable KPIs, actionable items that anybody at any level of business can achieve. It doesn't take a unique or special person to meet two new business owners each week. It doesn't take a unique or special person to add two new business owners to a database each week. The number one thing I observe with top producing agents, the number one area or blind spot that they're missing out in their business, eight times out of 10, is the failure to generate more referrals. I ask you this, to choose a simple or to a simple technique or plan to keep in touch with your past clients and your businesses and your SOI. This does not need to be difficult. It is just simply sending them some communication on a consistent basis. Remember, consistency communicates customer service. Consistency drives referrals. If you can show them that you're consistent with your marketing, I promise you they're going to send you business. Print marketing plan, email marketing plan, social media marketing plan, internet marketing plan. Have a plan for each of these. Have a tactic for each of these and KPIs that go along with them. For print mail, it is a mailer every single month to your database. Uh, Yes, a print mailer every single month to your database showing them that you are in the real estate business and that you are successfully and actively participating in selling homes. Email marketing plan, that you are consistently sending them valuable pieces of information that shows them that you're not only in the business, but you are an expert in understanding the questions that they have about real estate. Social media Back to the print mail technique of show them that you're in the business. Show them that you have a human side to you and that you're out there working the business and that you're successful. An internet marketing plan is your geographic or demographic marketing plan to drive those leads to you that fit your buyer or seller demographic. Have marketing plans for these. Now, as far as lead generation goes, the ability to go out and get leads, Annie Max Works program has multiple strategies for generating business. Every single one of these strategies works or they wouldn't have put it on this program. There's no need for you to go out and find the secret bullet. It exists right here. Just take some time, review some of the different lead strategies plans that they have on their system for free to you. Choose some of the strategies. Write down the tactics that you're going to hold your business accountable to and hold your business accountable to those tactics until you get a result. Track everything. I actually have templates for capturing my ideas because sometimes I come up with a great strategy, but it's not the right time to implement it. I don't have the bandwidth right now, but I don't want to lose this information. Have a way to track that and keep that strategy for you for a later date when you're ready to implement it. Have a way of tracking the decisions that you're making. 
One of the greatest proverbs is, before you tear down a wall, know why that wall was built. When you make a decision in your business, you made it for a reason. You need to write down and keep a way of tracking the reason that you made the decision the way you made it. In our business, we use our operations manual. We have a simple business, a simple manual that we just keep track of all the decisions that we that we made and the processes that we use to follow. Them. The reason is is later when we look back and we reflect on some of the decisions, instead of beating ourselves up and saying we made a bad decision or we somehow made a poor decision or that we're not smart enough or not good enough, we look back and say, that's the reason we made that decision. I remember. And you know what? That was the right decision for that time. But that's not the right decision that's going to get us to where we want to go. Keep track of your key performance indicators, your KPIs. All of them. Keep them weekly at best. Okay, Keep them and review them often because this is the indicators that's going to tell you you're on track with your business or if you're completely off track. These are like the dials and gauges in an airplane. They're going to tell you if you're on track to keep at altitude or if you're heading into the mountain that's right ahead of your face. And then a process for keeping track of your projects. We use what's called a roadmap. A roadmap is developed in order to keep in mind all the projects that have to be completed. I shared with you earlier that there's about 27 different things that have to be accomplished in a real estate business in order to keep it from fluctuating. What I've done is I've shared with Russ the agent self-analysis worksheet to help you identify where's the holes in your business. Now understand, it's going to take you a year to get these systems in place. These are not easy systems and projects to work on, yet once you get them built, your business will be able to achieve 100 units a year consistently. Now I know you ask yourself, ah, is this really possible? Is it really for me? Here's three examples of some clients that I've worked with in the past. Brian Parsons, he's in Pasadena, California. I remember one time I get on the phone with him and he says to me, I just returned from Hawaii and I just took three listings when I was gone. And in fact, two of them were under contract by the time he got back. Marcy is a mortgage loan officer. And when I started working with her, she was closing about four transactions a month. She was doing over 20 transactions a month. And we achieved that within one year. Monica is probably my most proud client. She has 11 pending and 11 more on the market in one month. She is on track to do $25 million this year. And next year, her goal is to achieve the same $25 million while decreasing her time and her involvement within her business, but maintaining profitability. Now, that's a goal I can get behind. This process, it's like learning to ride a bike for the first time or you expose yourself to some new information. You're going to go out and you're going to need to get onto the works program and you're going to need to learn some new lead generation techniques. One lead generation technique is not going to be enough to achieve 100 transactions next year. You're going to need to have multiple techniques. You're going to need to attempt each of them in a strategic manner, one at a time, and then you're going to fail. You're going to fail, and from failure, you're going to learn. From learning, you're going to attempt again until you then achieve your success. I know you can do this. In fact, Anybody can. Anybody with the heart and the desire to achieve it can do it. It's not an easy process. It's an uphill battle. But I believe in you. And I know Annie Mac believes in you too. Or they wouldn't have asked you here today. I want to once again thank everybody at Annie Mac Mortgage for bringing you together today for this program. I want to once again thank you for participating in this and listening to at, at times some of my rants and if you want more information my contact information is listed is listed below if you want to check out the reality show it's buying boulder tv.com and once again i thank you appreciate you annie mac mortgage and all that you're doing for these agents and all for free you guys are wonderful people it's back to you russ take it away